Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 171, MIA, dealing with absent players and another of the Bellhop's favorite forms of RPG, a starter set. I'm Sean, and here with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, working with you to make your game nights better. We record right here, live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. And it's always awesome when we can see you here live in our lobby, the chat room. So first off, I do have to say, may the fourth be with you. I have an appropriate mug that you can't actually read the word Star Wars on. <laughs> there we go. Except I always have an appropriate mug. It just happens to be more appropriate than usual today. Of course, the, the problem more people would be thinking is that it's kind of a dark side mug, <laughs> which is kind of weird that the Star Wars faded, but the dark side didn't. I guess it's the light <laughs> side of the dark side. Anyway, tonight we've got a mostly RPG-focused show, starting with a discussion about what to do when one of the players or multiple players don't show up. We follow that up with a review of the One Ring starter set from Free League Publishing, and we wrap up for some content for the board gaming fans with a Charterstone update, plays of Ex Libris and Downfall of Pompeii, first thoughts on Discover Lands Unknown, which I know a lot of people are waiting to hear about, and spell smashers there i got it right this time i have a terrible time saying that word and we're going to explore some expansions in gorinto and the quacks of quedlinburg welcome to the suggestion box here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk first up a comment on our chronicles of avel review joanna pikarska who works for the publisher in poland says thanks so much for this review so happy to hear you enjoy Chronicles of Avel, not only with younger players, but also in a group of adults. I'm glad you managed to figure out where Joanna was from, because I didn't see her on the BGG listing. So I'm like, I'm not sure what that name is, but that comment sounds like it's someone from the publisher. And as always, we always appreciate when publishers actually check out our content, especially when they like it. So thank you, Joanna. And uh, I'm drawing a blank on the name of the company right now. Rebel. Rebel Studio. Got All right, well, up next, we have a comment from Matt on our Party Games for Gamers Ask the Bellhop seg segment. Matt comments, super good video, guys. We've been needing an updated party game video for gamers. Blessings and love. Oh, thanks, Matt. I got to say this one's proved pretty popular. And I agree, actually, like you mentioned that and I looked into it and I'm like, yeah, it's true. Like all the lists out there are a little dated. Like, yes, everyone knows to go get code names and everyone knows to get illustrations, but not everyone knows about some of the newer games that we did mention in that episode, which I'll leave you to discover on your own. All right. Well, next up, Super Commando 440 found our Draconis Invasion unboxing and wrote okay. to say, Dang, the website for this game says ultimate deck building game for one to six players and over 500 beautifully illustrated cards. Are there really over 500 cards in that? Didn't look like it. So I think you got a, a, a box size versus content problem here, kind of an illusion going on because that box does look pretty empty. Uh, when you look at the size of the box and the very small pack of cards and how little room they take up, I, there are 500 plus cards in there. I'll admit I didn't count them, but they're definitely there. This is one of those cases where the designer pre-planned to have a game box that will fit multiple expansions, which is awesome or terrible depending on your perspective. Some people hate it because they get a half empty box. Others love it because then they don't have to go buy a box separately, as you often have to do for these deck building games. Now, there is already one expansion out, and I admit it takes up a significant chunk of the empty space, though not all of it, and a second expansion is kickstarting soon, though that's not going to take up much space at all. Though, to be fair, there are over 400 or 500 cards in the set for sure, but one thing I realized that maybe what Super Commando is not getting is it's not 500 different cards, because this is Dominion-style deck builder. It's not like Clank, where you have a deck of completely different cards you're buying from. You're making piles of the same card. And off the top of my head, I can't remember if it's 10, 12, or 15 of each card. But you're getting multiple copies of the same card. But there are 500 total cards, not 500 different cards, if that makes sense. All right. Well, next, Brock Wigger tweeted, I heartily recommend putting a little electric tea light candle in the volcano to make it mm -hmm. flicker. It adds a whole layer of ambience. Also, it's mandatory that you make a little scream whenever you throw someone in the volcano. <laughs> and that was in regards to our downfall of Pompeii unboxing. Yeah, just in case you didn't know. And honestly, I picked this one because Brox was the most detailed. 
but I I got so many comments about tea lights. Like I could actually say the whole, you know, if I had a 10 cents for every tea light comment I get on an Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter post with down Paw Pompeii, I'd be rich. Well, I wouldn't be rich, but I'd probably have about like five bucks by now. Every time I share a picture of this game, someone's like, oh, I hope you had a tea light in there. Oh, do you use a tea light? Did you get a freaking tea flickering tea light? Someone even suggested candle, but I'm thinking that's got a bad, bad idea with the plastic uh, volcano. Yeah, that's uh, so. Yeah, um, maybe sometime I will actually go pick up a candle for, or sorry, a tea light, a flickering LED tea light uh, for my copy of Downfall of Pompeii. But for now, no, 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 no tea lights for mine. Though we do often scream while people are being thrown into the volcano. We also have a whole theory about one of the houses that you just don't live there because people go missing all the time. That's another that that's become a meme in our games. <laughs> So next up, I got a couple comments that I'm going to read off and I'd like Sean to answer because this goes back to when Sean was sharing thoughts on eight different superhero RPGs he had just read. No, just happened to be the ones he read. People seem to miss that part. Uh, for some reason, this post has exploded. I don't know where we got linked or if it's just the, the Google juice is good on that one. Our SEO suddenly got noticed. Whatever it is, that post is actually one of our most popular posts on the blog this week. And we've gotten multiple comments on it. So first up, Matthew H. Iskra writes, The elephant in the room for me reading this is, what about Champions Hero System? The crunchiest of them all. This game has mostly died except for old fans, but it was a dominant force in superhero games for decades. And if you can handle the crunch, still holds up better than most games that saw their origin in the late 70s. I also noted there was no review or mention of the Marvel Universe RPG, which I would have liked. Did that one fade away? After being a Champions Hero System GM for decades, I'm interested in a suitable replacement my players will enjoy. So far, at least in my gaming circle, Mutants and Masterminds seems to be the dominant, with Masks a distant second. I'm not sure why, but PBTA games have not gone over well with my circle and other groups I know of. Not criticizing them, they just don't seem to inspire the players for follow-up games. Thanks for the article, and thank you, fellow posters, which I think was for the other people who had commented on this post already. Well, I mean, the easy answer is I haven't played and I don't have those. <laughs> so they weren't on the list. Uh, they are right, though. Champions is always in the back of every super heroic <laughs> gamer's mind. In my case, it's there like a shadowy figure with a knife in a dark alley. <laughs> I should probably and probably will delve into it at least as a read, but I strongly doubt it is something I would ever get to the table uh, as for marvel we covered the new one last week and did mention a bit about some of the previous iterations as well so it's definitely worth checking out that episode about marvel uh well, when it comes will admit, yep, yep we do not talk about marvel the, the, the specific one they call marvel universe rpg is the one i mentioned that's the one i missed right so i don't i don't have an opinion on the marvel universe rpg it's the one marvel system <laughs> i never picked up and never played and then uh, otherwise, when it comes to uh, sort of champion uh, mutants and masterminds versus PBTA, they are so very different. I mean, if you like crunchy games as a as a group, you're probably not going to like PBTA because oh. you're missing that that, you know, detail that 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 mm -hmm. I need to make sure that I'm in the right place to be able to fire this, to do this, to do that. It's just not there. That's not the kind of game it is. So it doesn't make it doesn't surprise me at all that your uh, your group may be uh, not really feeling that. The next up, Rich the Blue Geek writes, you might check out Wearing the Cape RPG. While it's based on Fate, there are some elements of crunch for those who like that. I got a side note. I got to say Fate's pretty crunchy to me. It's no, no champions, but I, I do not see Fate as a non-crunchy game. Now, power building is flexible, but there are established archetypes to make it easier for people who don't want to design a power set from scratch. Its biggest strength is that the rich setting is based on a series of books by the same name, so there's plenty of inspiration to work with. The author has also written Super Powered Fate, which decouples the power building mechanic from the setting to use with Fate Condensed. Now, if you prefer mechanics closer to Fate Core, there's the Vulture City Sourcebook by Evil Hat, but world building in that is pretty weak. Setting is what I might call super punk, but the material is easily adapted to other settings. And that's Venture City, not Vulture City. Oh, sorry, my bad. Uh, so I have actually got Wearing the Cape in my collection. It's it's there in the list of uh, PDF-only uh, books. I just haven't gotten around to it. 
Um, there will surely be a follow up ep episode about more super games, but I really actually need to get some reading done and possibly even just find a new twist for the topic rather than just eight more games. I don't know what works. We could just stick with it and be like, <laughs> oh, we have nine more superhero games and what sets them apart. And then next year we'll do 10 more superhero games and what sets them apart. Uh, as for Venture City, I have added it to my wish list, but since I don't have a copy of Fate Core, uh, mm. I'm going to wait to to get a copy of that before I pull the trigger on adding Venture City to the list. What I should do is just lend you my Fate Core when you're down, because I kickstarted <laughs> Fate Core. I've got it and all that. Well, the, the original wave of stuff that came out with the Kickstarter. So finally, some thoughts on our from our frequent commenter, Chris Groff, hey, on our last AMA. In regards to the Marvel RPG, there is nothing warming about the new Marvel game when reading through the documents so far. Everything just seems like a lot of red flags to me. Marvel Heroic still sets the bar for comic book heroes to me. Yeah. As you said, the rule book doesn't give a good presentation on how it totally. plays. But once you play it, it all clicks extremely well. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the new 616 game, as you mentioned, looks to have a heavy set of crunch and traditional style mechanics to it, mm -hmm. which I just can't see working for a hero game anymore. I don't want D&D style dungeon crawl games, but with supers. That's boring and generic. I don't want a hero game where you are basically defining stats and comparing them in a traditional manner. Comics don't work that way. They never have. So the RPG shouldn't work that way either. So what I do like about this comment that I didn't even realize till we're reading them in a row is this really offsets the first comment there about champions. Obviously, there are different groups of gamers who are going to be looking for different things. And I've got to say, 616 is probably going to appeal more to the champions gamers than it is to the masks players. So this was actually um, based on our initial thoughts, right? So we, Sean hadn't picked up the book. It was an AMA and one of the, I think, I think it might've been, um, might've been tech or math guy, Dave, who was like, so thoughts on the new Marvel RPG. And we just kind of talked about it, but it was mostly speculation. We were, we were going off what happened to be out there in like a couple of character sheets that were out there. So what I did want to do is point Chris, which I already did, and anyone else listening to last week's episode, because we actually did a more involved review where we honestly kind of come to the same conclusion as Chris here. Uh, while the game does show some promise, and we're hoping for it to go into a more narrative way, in its current state, it's not really the kind of game we're looking for for playing supers either. Yep. So Chris goes on to comment about what legacy game we should play next to say, <laughs> Clank Legacy is fantastic. I need to get that. Really loved it, and the family did as well. Plus the fact that you end up with an excellent, fully playable version of Clank in the end is a huge bonus. I'm tempted to pick up another set to play through oh, wow. it all again with a different group of friends. And he then leaves off with Hero Quest. Felt like nostalgia cash grab and nothing more. Fair. I I was expecting so much more from Hero Quest, especially when they announced they were going to put out expansions that no one can now get. Anyway, thanks for all the comments, Chris. As usual, um, Clank Legacy definitely on my list of games to explore, probably with Tori and Cat. Um, though at this point, it is not going to be our follow up to Charterstone. We did make a final decision on that, and what we are going to be doing is moving on to the One Ring starter set. Yes, a full on RPG which you can learn more about if you just stay tuned for the review segment later in the show. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. We do have one announcement before we move on to our main topic tonight. All right. The only thing I can say good about this is this is the first time in three years I think we've had to do this. So last week we reviewed Founders of Teotihuacan and... When I was working on the written review for the blog, Sean was editing the video version, and we both ended up noticing a couple of mistakes we made. So I want to take a moment to correct those. So one of these was that I mentioned plastic components in the original Teotihuacan and how I was disappointed we didn't get plastic here. Now, I think I was confusing Teotihuacan with Dragon Castle. Dragon Castle is a game with Mahjong-like tiles where you're building a castle and putting lids on it, whereas Teo is a game about building a pyramid. And the pyramid tiles in Teo are actually wood. There is no plastic tiles in City of the Gods. So I did mess that up. Now, as for what I was saying, it still doesn't change. It would have been nice to have wood instead of plastic. I just would have liked nicer components. So that didn't change, but I did get that one wrong. 
Now, the one thing I noticed though was when we were talking about who should pick up this new Teotihuacan game, Mo mentioned being able to play online. This was a mistake. While you can play the original Teotihuacan online, we are not currently able to find any way to play Founders online at this time, even you know unlicensed versions hidden yeah. away on Tabletop Simulator. And honestly, like looking at the promo images I received, they're obviously digital renders. And I think I just thought they were obviously Tabletopia or something. But no, it seems at this point you cannot. Though the fact that the original City of the Gods is on there, it may be coming. Yep. So if it does come, it'll be a good way to try it. All right, finally, this is the big one in my opinion. Uh, we had, I messed up when explaining one of the rules. Now, specifically in regards to moving your architect, and this is the meeple that goes around the outside of your board that shows where you can build, what quadrants you can build in. Now, I said you move it at the end of the round. That is wrong. You actually do it at the end of each turn. And honestly, that's a pretty significant change to the game. We apologize for these mistakes. And as always, if you do notice a mistake yeah. in any of our content, please feel free to point it out. Oh, we did discover these on our own. Yeah, well, thankfully, we... <laughs> I didn't have like the designer writing me saying, you played it wrong. Now, while we can't do anything about the review in the full podcast episode, the written review has already been edited to correct these errors, and there will be some text overlays on the video to point out the mistakes. Again, apologies. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. So due to the fact we're reviewing a new role-playing game tonight, later in the show, I thought it would be worth diving into our question pile, specifically looking for RPG-related questions. So the kind of the overall theme of the show would be role-playing based content instead of board game content. So when doing this, um, we did have a few questions. We definitely get more board game ones. So feel free, if you got RPG questions, send the questions at tabletophillhop.com. But in looking through the list, I did find three different questions that were basically all asking the same thing, which I would summarize as, what should you do when someone can't make it for a game session? I gotta say, this seemed like a pretty solid topic. And I know we've kind of skirted around this. It's stuff that's come up before. We've discussed it during previous AMAs. What do you do when someone doesn't show up for a Gloomhaven game, which is kind of mish a mishmash. And we've answered very specific questions. And I know we've also touched upon it in other topics, like dealing with problem players, where we actually talked about abs like chronic absenteeism. But what we've never done is specifically just talked about absenteeism and what to do. We've never actually deep dived what to do with absent players. So I thought it would be a good topic for tonight. So. Well, personally, I thought this was easy. You strip their character of all items and leave them staked out for the birds to feast on. Oh, wait, you mean they're just taking a break and they're coming back to the game? Sorry, sorry. That's, uh... <laughs> Honestly, I think that'd be a totally different what to do when someone leaves your game which is, is something else we could get into. And, and I probably still don't suggest Sean's method unless <laughs> they, they, they left on very unfavorable circumstances. So what I do want to point out, though, is um, before we dive into what to do when someone can't make it, I want to start off by saying something I personally think is very important and more people need to take heed to is that it's okay to miss a game night. We're all adults, or even if we're kids, we all have things we have to do. We all have things that come up. We all have obligations. We have family. We have friends. Getting together with other people to play a game is a hobby. It's a pastime. It's a luxury. It's something we are doing for fun, and it should be treated as that. Yes, I realized back in the day, game night was the be-all, end-all, and if you didn't make it to game night, you were betraying everyone. Well, that needs to go out the window like some of those other old Ronnarg ideas. It is not the end of the world if someone misses a game night. Similarly, if you do need to miss a game night, do it. Like, don't feel totally obligated, but do it responsibly. Don't just throw it out the window, but realize personal health well-being, you don't have enough spoons, you have to deal with your kids, you have to work, all of it are valid reasons to miss a game night. In fact, some people should probably miss more game nights mm. than they do. While we have talked on other episodes about obligations in when you agree to play with a group, yes, you do have a larger life. And as Mo just said, thinking about your physical and mental health, as well as your relationship healths, Yes. These are important to you as well and should not necessarily go by the wayside just because you said I'm supposed to play a game every Wednesday night. Period. Yes. 
and and please don't do the pride tired oh the spouse hates it it's game night i don't want you know don't all that should be long gone it's 2022 people so it does lead me to my first suggestion on what you should do when someone misses or well rather what you shouldn't do don't punish people for not showing up now this is especially true for valid reasons what we just talked about but even invalid reasons, even if you just got sloughed off or ghosted, don't punish someone in a game for something that happened outside of the game. This should be talked about outside of the game. It shouldn't be part of the ongoing um, group dynamic. It shouldn't be something that involves everyone. If absenteeism becomes an ongoing issue, this is a group problem and should be taken care of outside of the game where you're going to do the adult thing and have a conversation. This might mean having a session 0.1, 1.5, whatever you want to call it, where you get everyone together and discuss it. It might be a matter of talking to the person and give the person an out. Like, don't be confrontational. Don't, you miss too many sessions. We're kicking you out of the group is not the right way to handle this. It's the, you know what? You haven't been able to make it to the last things. First of all, are, are you still interested in coming? Like, if you're not having a good time and you want to back out, you have other things to do, feel free. Did you meet someone new and you have more interesting things to do? We get it. We all have lives. If you'd like, we can do that. Or how about you only show up every other week? Like, talk it out. Um, we're not going to go through all the possible different solutions here. That's not what the main topic is tonight. But handle it outside the game. Coming up with a, well, if you don't show up, you're not going to get XP. Oh, and then when the person's not there, give out all the magic items or any of that other literally passive aggressive bullshit don't do that yeah when talking about commitment yeah you know, something we talk about here all the time again is that setting expectations mm -hmm. whether it's a session zero or a session 1.5 or whatever helping curbing attendance issues that aren't necessarily what you might consider valid you know there aren't that that isn't because someone just doesn't have the spoons to play or you know can't can't make it one day uh making sure you've set those expectations, not only just of where and how often you're going to be playing, but how to cancel. You know, if, if even if someone has to cancel at the very last minute, that's okay. But if there's any notice that you can give the group, mm -hmm. that's going to go over better. And that's going to make everyone feel better about things. And, and part of that's all this is, is just making the group okay with things and understanding you know, if you're canceling as everyone is driving to the event, that's different than if you yes. realize that something has been scheduled and is going to conflict and a day in advance or even two hours in advance, you're calling and letting everyone know. Like I would even suggest further, like as your session zero, um, perhaps in your, your, your group, I'm drawing a blank on the term social contract whether it's written or not, written or unwritten social contract. And yes, written social contracts are a thing and more and more people are using them. You should note that like you want a week's notice. And if you don't get a week's notice and, and have a plan, because that way, if you have a week's notice, you know, we're going to plan to do something else and have a contingency for when that happens. And then maybe even have a different contingency when it's a last minute cancellation and what's acceptable reasons to not show up, which again, almost everything should be an acceptable reason not to show up. And like if even I don't feel like playing today should be a valid reason you're it's it's supposed to be fun the whole point of gaming is to get together with other people and have fun together and what everyone should have learned by now and you see reiterated over and over again in modern gaming is it's all about everyone at the table having fun not just one person or the majority of people but everyone having fun and if just one person isn't going to have fun you shouldn't probably be gaming that night no absolutely uh, it's just one of those things where you need to be communicating uh, and, and communicating up front to let no expectations, but then communicating all the way along and continuing the communications uh, throughout and between games. Mm -hmm. So enough about that. Let's get to do with uh, what to do when someone isn't there, when, when someone or multiple people are missing um, and, and what you what to do that game night, right? At this point, who cares if it was valid or not? Now, again, we will reiterate, these should be planned ahead. This shouldn't be a surprise. Everyone showing up should know which of these suggestions we're going to talk about, you're going to do and have an established pattern, especially if you know there's going to be people who miss all the time. 
now, like say people who work shift work, you get a regular schedule, but then maybe you have someone who has a newborn child or even a toddler or whatever, a, a new high schooler who's just starting a new semester, any of those reasons. Um, you should have an established plan or possibly multiples. Uh, with my own group, there were different things, depending on different how many people canceled, when they canceled, how far ahead they canceled, all led to different outcomes. So the first suggestion is probably the easiest um, but not necessarily the best, and that is to play something else. This is what my group did. We had a particular set of, well, actually, I don't even know how many people were in my last RPG game, but it was like six core group, but then we added a couple people a couple times, probably a max of like eight people. But our rule was if we had four players and me, so five showed up, we played. No matter who happened to be there, we played that game, which at the time was Warhammer 3rd Edition, which then moved on to... Um, Star Wars Edge of the Empire. The rule was, though, if four people showed up, we played. And otherwise, we played something else. Now, for us, that was board games. As well, I, you probably listen to this podcast, you know who we are, and we talk a lot about board games, and I have a significant board game collection, and most of the people I played with RPGs with, actually, all the people I play RPGs with were just as much board game players. So they had no problem playing board games. Now, it doesn't also have to be the same, like, like something else doesn't have to mean a different type of game either. You could always play another role-playing game as well. Um, though playing another game sometimes gets into that risk of the other game being more popular than the first game, which honestly has happened to me a couple times. Um, even worse is when the, uh, the players still like the original RPG, but as the DM, I'm all about the new hotness and I kind of want to play the new one and then I lose interest in the other one. But anyway, someone can't make it. Don't worry about fixing the campaign or trying to deal without the, the main heroine or the person with the, the keys isn't there. What any of the other problems that can come up when someone's missing a role playing game? Just play something else. Get back to your regular game as soon as possible. Yeah. And this is uh, especially uh, there's a whole lot of different uh, options here. And again, we get back to you know session zero. But, you know, everyone may be board game players you know everyone everyone who hangs out with mo is generally a board game player that's that's who he connects with but they may not all be heavy euro players mm -hmm. uh some of them may really only like you know family uh, family weight party games uh mm -hmm. and so you need to have some expectations set as to whether or not you're going to be pulling out food chain magnet or you know something a little on the lighter side of, yep. of things now the next option is just the complete opposite so i put these in this order because you got one end and the other end and then we'll talk about some stuff in the middle play without them uh like i said we played if we my group if i had four us four players showed up we played uh which worked right we that way we got to play the campaign continued i happen to be running established published modules so we were working through the published books players with characters would advance the story would line would advance and the other players just missed out on having the fun of being at the game and missed some of the story but not enough like like we we would never have a world shattering event happen in a game that someone's missing from now, of course, this leads to lots of problems in role-playing games, especially if you are one of those gamers who, um, to go back to an earlier comment, are, are funs, fun, fans of the verisimilitude in the, the, the crunch and the champion-style games and the simulation-style RPGs where you want it to feel like a living world, you're going to have a problem. If that's your group, you probably don't want to play with it. You probably only want to run when your full group's there. Personally, I think most RPG groups nowadays have moved away from that simulationist feel and aren't about trying to recreate a fantasy world, but more about howling a story in a fantasy world. But I do know there are groups out there. I know a group that still plays Rollmaster regularly and literally will not play if a character's missing because to them that breaks the immersion. So to each their own. Um, but if you don't have that, you got to figure out what happened to their characters. At least come up with some excuse. And and this this can really different uh, vary on whether or not you're playing you know printed and and published manuals or if you've got your own sandbox mm -hmm. rule. If you're playing a sandbox rule, then they went to visit their mom or they've gone mm -hmm. off on a pilgrimage for their priest or you know there's a million different things that don't necessarily impact the game world, but yes. just means they don't happen to be there that day and it's not a problem at all. Whereas if you're playing an established adventure and you've all just made it into the dragon's lair, 
explaining why Bob suddenly mm-hmm. isn't there in the next room is a little more problematic. <laughs> so I'm going to pull out some of my own tricks from my own, my own DMs hat of tricks or bag of tricks that I have done. So the first one I was running fourth ed D and D please don't at me about fourth ed D and D cause I'll just at you back with it being an awesome system. Um, and we had players who were playing who were on shift work at the time I worked in the auto industry. And so did many of my players It ended up that we were playing every two weeks but then I got off shift work. So I wanted to run the game every week and I had a new player join because they happened to be on the other shift. And well, what was happening was this one two player would swap. Like, like Mike was there two weeks and Dan was there the other two weeks. So I came up with a solution. Mike and Dan's character were schizophrenic and they were the same character. So every two weeks they swapped who was controlling the character. And I actually went so far to go that, you know what, it's D and D it's fantasy they like changed classes and everything. So that way everyone got their own player character. And that honestly, for that solution worked really well. And please know, I was not trying to make fun of mental illness. And back then I didn't even realize that was something I should be concerned about. It's something I now am more aware of that maybe I shouldn't just casually toss schizophrenia in my game. But at the time I wasn't aware of that, but we all learn and grow. Another solution I've had was we were playing again fourth ed DD, but this was a later we were playing the um thunderspire labyrinth adventure at the time and things got a little messy in a couple of my gamers lives uh, a couple of the players lives so what we did is in that adventure the shadow fell in the fail wild we're starting to encroach on reality so what we said was anytime a player couldn't show up they slipped through a portal they slipped through the cracks and we're in the other world and then what we did in that game was what they had to do as and again, I'm slightly punishing them, but I think it was in a fun way. Was they were responsible when they came back to tell us what happened to their character and how they earned the same amount of XP as everyone else, which they didn't have to tell me exactly what monsters they killed, but they had to give me some kind of story on the adventure they went on, and then they got the same XP as everyone else who played. And because, that's, and while what, that's a little bit of a stretch, maybe for some D and D groups, I think in a lot of modern, especially narrative groups, that's something that people will yeah. actually. In, in one, you know, I can't yes. be here this week, so I'm going to work on a killer story. You better see the story yep, I'm going to have exactly. when I get back next week, uh, because that's part of the narrative style is having yes. these good stories. And and honestly, I, I wouldn't have punished someone if they showed up without a story and you shouldn't as well. But it's the encouragement, right? A little bit of encouragement, a little bit of a carrot that, hey, tell me a story. And yes, yeah, some people came back with fantastic stories. We even had a player show up with a bronze statue of the elf she met that she sculpted well in the Feywild and now had a love interest. And she brought the statue her her character had sculpted, which, no, she didn't personally sculpt it. She found it at Value Village, but, like, showed up with props. It was pretty awesome. So that those are my favorite ways, is honestly to find an excuse for the characters not to be there. And as Sean said, modern narrative gaming, you don't have to make up the excuse. Make the player give you an excuse. Why wasn't your character here last week? That, that is the the improv style of gaming that, that many of us now prefer. And that is actually my, my biggest recommendation is if a player can't make it, when they show up with their character, the first thing they have to do is tell you, where were they? What were you doing? Now, one thing that's interesting is, uh, again, a big difference between your D&D style games, your crunchy games versus your PBTA style games and things is XP. You know, we talk about not punishing people for XP. So in a D&D game, if the group got 500 XP, give 500 XP to the missing player. Yeah. Not a big deal. It's a little weirder in PBTA, whereas the yeah. only time you get experience is when you fail your rolls. And to be fair, it's not all that big a deal. I mean, yeah. there are often times where if your dice are working for you or you haven't really, uh, you know, you had an off week and you weren't contributing quite as much, so you didn't make as many rolls, you just didn't get any XP that mm-hmm. week. And, and that's not a bad thing. Uh, so unless there's, unless someone is regularly missing things, they've got a schedule where again, you know, if they're, if they're off two weeks on two weeks, that might, you might want to give them some potential uh, at that point. But in a lot mm-hmm. of these narrative games, it's not a punishment if they don't get that same mm-hmm. level of XP as they would in a crunchier game. And I will admit, um, not that it's my system, but D&D 5e has even moved away from the our XP system that the rest of us grew up with. It's much more story-based. But again, give them the story base as well. 
right? Like just yeah. because they weren't there when you got to the peak of Lonely Mountain, give them the XP for getting to the peak of Lonely Mountain. You especially um, with, well, and especially with D and D, one of the other big things is party balance. Um, yeah. You don't want to suddenly imbalance your whole party, especially when they're working, you know, working in a combat situation as a team. Yeah. You don't want to ha you have the, you know, all of a sudden your tank is two levels behind everyone else and combats are getting thrown off as a result mm -hmm. where you don't get that issue in most uh, in a lot of your uh, your less crunchy systems. And another thing you can do, and this is something for, especially for stickler, like the people who are, I need to earn my XP. Telling a story doesn't earn it. Trust me, I know a player like that. I have one. Um, I've been a while since I played with them. But one of the other options you can do is maybe run a one shot for the player, or if two players mix, do a little buddy cop thing off on the side mm -hmm. and give them away to to earn that XP, or or do some other way. Whether it's tell a story, do some extra some extra work give me some background or you could even do like a um like a flashback scene is another way to do it where instead of playing their main character you give them a little side scene to to again flashback while they were doing this let's play through where you were now that generally works back if you can you know get the player to show up early or after or maybe run something through like discord play by forum or uh, even through uh, zoom or something like that just to get the person the xp they're missing now again that's a, not for me i probably wouldn't go that far i don't care that much I, <laughs> um but if that's what your group's like if that's what you're all about earning every xp and while we're saying D, &D isn't about this so there's lots of people out there playing O D D still and playing you know the white hack and um what's a old school essentials and those games are all about that but those games are also designed to run a party that when you die, you come back to first level and rejoin the party. So they're designed to have unbalanced parties. So I don't think it's as big a deal. The big thing, you just don't want it to be punished. You don't want someone to feel like they missed out on more than just the session. Missing out on the game session should be enough of a penalty instead of then punishing them in game. Again, you don't want to punish someone for something that happens out of game in game. This is not just true for absenteeism, but again, we're not going to get into problem players here. Well, and the other issue is, and again, with uh, specifically with the more modern games, you don't want to punish the other people at the table. So again, if you've got that fighter who's had to miss a bunch of games and is all of a sudden, again, your tank is two levels below everyone else, that's punishing the rest of the team because you're no longer able to fight mm -hmm. in that same method. And what that's going to encourage is for less people to take the opportunity to step away, even if they yeah. might need to. And you do not want to discourage that. If people need the time to take their time off, let them take the time off and don't make it uh, punishing for them so that they are scared to step away because, oh, my God, the rest of the, mm -hmm. the rest of the team is going to hate me if I do that. Yeah. Like there's a reason that my Warhammer game went for three years and why <laughs> I never got the edge of the empire really running like I, I, my group of players were all adults that had things going on in their lives, myself included. I obviously have some health issues. Like there were many reasons why we missed. So next suggestion, this again, we're going from the middle from between, between um, just go play something else, but don't play what you're supposed to be playing to play. So this is play, play the same game, but don't play your core adventure. Play through a side plot or a side quest or do a flashback or do a shopping adventure or do some other in-game thing that's using your characters that adds to the game world and adds to the story but doesn't progress the main plot and i'm pretty sure in today's day and age everyone's played enough video games that even if you're not familiar with rpgs you know exactly what i'm talking about i have wasted many many hours in games like horizon zero dawn not progressing the main plot it doesn't always have to be marching forward yeah, that that cat with a spotlight on it is telling you that something's going to happen if you go check out that cat. Well, maybe this, that's what you do on the time when uh, when someone's not there. Actually, you know. that's a good thing I hadn't thought of. Remember two sessions ago when there was that branching path or there was that time we didn't help out Farmer Miller with his sick goat because we were too busy with the orcs. Maybe now is the time to go back to town and help out Farmer Miller. Go check out that side path. And, and it's, this is especially valid if you've got, you know, something that you were talking about earlier, where you've got the people who can't show up uh, regularly. So you've got people mm -hmm. who, who are, who are uh, your, or groups of people who are, who are on different schedules, you know, hey, maybe team A didn't 
care about Farmer um, Herschel's problems, but Team C was really thinking about it. And you know what? Before we move on to that next thing, we are going to go back and help out Farmer Herschel. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, when when whoever gets back from their, uh, you know, trip down south, uh, down the river, then we can go back to trying to find the dragon or whatever. <laughs> Now, to take this a step further, and this is something I wish I had even known about as a thing, and I think I first heard it in one of the Robin Laws' books as a suggestion, is to play other people in the same game. Put your characters aside for the one session, then maybe play your favorite NPCs. Your characters have hirelings that have been traveling along with them, you know how much fun you could have where everyone takes on the role of one of those hirelings and all you play out is a night at the inn where they're bitching about the party they're working with? You're going to have a great time with that. Or here's the Robin Laws one that I thought was utterly brilliant is give the players control of the main villains for a group and have them plot against their own characters. You would be amazed just how evil people can be to their own characters. Plus, you get something that's very rare in role-playing games, but is very popular in pretty much every other form of medium, which is dramatic irony. That's when the people watching and taking part know something the characters don't, which is not something most RPG players are used to, though people are getting more used to it. But like being able to know that the bad guy plotted this thing ahead because you plotted it is a fantastic experience to play through that. Uh, another option is play another adventuring party in the same city or region. Uh, you know, Team A went off to check out the dungeon. Team B suddenly comes into town and can make real and definite changes mm -hmm. to that world or city or area that when they move on again, then the other team comes back and all of a sudden things have changed in their city. And why? Maybe maybe your favorite barkeep has got a new favorite patron and they're wishing mm -hmm. they'd come back. And this these guys are, are, are you know, aren't paying up as much. You know, the other team tipped better. <laughs> <laughs> or the other team comes in and raided the town because just recently there was a huge influx of gold mm -hmm. we're not sure where it came from but all of a sudden the prices went up or play the shop keeps for a week there you go there's so many options there's so many people in the world of your game, yes. especially if you're playing sandbox but even if you're not playing sandbox oh. your world is populous and the more real that population feels the more interesting the game is mm -hmm. in both on both sides of the fence. Yep. And to tie this into a topic we talked about two, three weeks ago about using board games with role-playing games. Maybe this is a chance to play something outside your game, but that impacts your main game, whether that's an, a, a, a mighty empire's sprawling armies moving on a map thing, which you then throw into the world events going around the characters, or it's just a matter of... What's another example? Playing through a sci-fi 4X game to determine who the new galactic emperor is. And while the characters were off fighting the evil alien race, they get back and ends up there's a new emperor and someone new in charge, um, possibly controlled by one of the player characters. Uh, there's some lots of interesting ways you could tie other games in to affect your RPG. So even if you do just decide to have board game night, you might be able to way, find a way to have that impact your game world. Absolutely. And there's so many ways to do this. And I mean, it could be as simple as playing a game that is in no way related to your game, but you, you know, play some bets on on outcomes for 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 your game. You know, you're playing a cart, you're playing some sort of card game, trick taking game, and you're but you're playing it as the players mm -hmm. so that the, the outcome yeah, as the characters. So the outcome has perhaps financial impact oh, yeah. inside the game. You know, there's lots of ways to play that out. Play, play a game of Red Dragon in, but use your character's gold. <laughs> there you go. Now, another thing you can do is world building. The, it, now, uh, this is broad, and I'm not going to get into all the different ways you can do world building, but play your game, but don't play your characters. Don't role play that week. Instead, do whatever. Generate NPCs. Those, those hirelings, give them names and backstories. The town you're in, Everyone defines two buildings or even do, um, um, what do you call pre-planning? The stupid buzzword is jumping out of my head. You're planning ahead for something that may or may not happen in the future. You're being proactive. Okay. Be proactive and just build a bunch of towns and interesting places that could be found in towns. 
every player sits down, you grab an index card, and then you randomly draw a card out of a deck. And then based on the suit, you have to design a type of business. And then the DM gets these in their pot of DM tools that they can swirl around and pull out in a later session. So that it's not on the DM three weeks from now, then when you go to town and go, oh, I need to buy a gold ring, Who, where, where would I go? They can go, oh, remember six weeks ago, Sean made up that goldsmith who was a gnome who was actually a uh, dragon in disguise or whatever the heck it happened to be. Um, there are games designed to do this. Uh, Microscope and Kingdom are the two that come to mind, but there are others. Um, another example is I could totally see using For the Queen as a development could just be to find out what happens between two kingdoms, what's the end result, or to develop characters in the royal court of your whatever say. It doesn't have to be For the Queen. There's enough variants out there you can play. You could just deep dive a game like that. Um, one that I know Sean is a fan of is building your base, build your hero's lair, build your thieves guild. Um for people who are into kingdoms and owning land, do the finances. Like there's often some math that happens in the background that you don't really want to interrupt your main game for, but is worth doing. Absolutely. I, I at one point developed an entire casino for my rogue in Warhammer, uh, and we worked out the finances for it. So I knew that if a month went by, this is, you know, this is the finances for the, uh, for the casino if I ever actually managed to get back there to, to collect. And if I remember, the odds weren't always in your favor. There was a chance you could lose money. Oh, yeah, absolutely. There were rolls yeah. for it and everything. Now, other things you could do for that, uh, world building that's more um, close to heart, more player focused, is you got players do these kind of things for their characters. Uh, what's the name of your sword? What's um, more background information? Um, look at your things like your keywords, your inspirations, your. Um, my brain today is just like <laughs> missing all the little words, the fate thing, whatever the aspects, uh, look at your aspects, see if there's things you want to tweak about your character. Maybe you do some character building or character planning. Speaking of Sean and Warhammer, Sean's one of those people who would plan his character out 12 careers ahead of time. Those can also be valid things you can do that still let you interact with your game, but not play it. There's also some some great things, especially when you're getting into modern games. So again, I'm going to talk about masks here because it's what I know best. But when you start a game of masks, part of the creation of your character and your team is a set of questions. Well, if there are other questions that are available to be asked, so if not everyone has played, you know, if certain character classes, uh, playbooks haven't been played, there are other questions that could be asked to players mm -hmm. about, you know, the first time you had a you 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 all got together and, and had an adventure, uh, but you can also come up with other questions. You can have the team or the team that's available develop more about their characters' backstories simply mm -hmm. by going through question and answers and let the let the players who are there play off each other and enhance relationships or or cause you know trouble. Throw in new NPCs. That's one of the fantastic things about these you know player forward narrative driven improv games where the players are supposed to be doing a lot of this anyway. So use that opportunity mm -hmm. to ask them questions and, and find out and develop things. You can even get them to, whether they know it or not, develop all the villains that you're going to be playing for the next mm -hmm. month because they will develop a few, you know, uh, antagonists that they met earlier in their lives before the team formed. Uh, there's so much potential there just sitting around, mm -hmm. shooting the shoot, uh, asking questions about characters. And honestly, there are a ton of online tools for this. Questions to ask your character. Um, I can't remember. Might have been Alien. One of the RPG box sets I reviewed recently had like a hundred questions to ask your character before you started playing. And I read that and I went, there is no way I'd want to do this in session zero. Because for me, I'm one of those players where my characters will develop as I play. Absolutely. Just give me a set of numbers. I don't know who my parents are yet. But if you're we're playing and you come up, come to me in the middle of it and you go, blah, 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 tell me about your dad, I'll have it. But I, I am not one of those people who comes up with all that ahead of time. But there are these questions. And I, I sorry, I can't remember which game it was I reviewed. It was something we reviewed that had one of these like hundred questions to ask yourself before you start playing your character. And there are tons of these character surveys that you can find online. Well, and world now, building too. I mean, there are yes. some books out there about world building where as the DM, you might go ahead and, 
redo all this stuff, but it's just as easy to ask these questions that you could be asking yourself to your players mm -hmm. and again, involve them in the creation of the world. So here's a tip that um, you can do for all of these suggestions is rotate roles for a week. So normally I run Warhammer third edition. We play my game. We play our thing. How about this week? You know what? Sean's not going to be here. So you know what, Deanna, why don't you run the game for the rest of us? And then you can use our other suggestions, right? Play a side quest, play a different story, play different heroes, but just give the DM a break for a week, which is another way you can help prevent burnout, which DM burnout is definitely a thing. And give someone else a chance to take on that role without the responsibility of running a campaign and having to run the regular game for people. Just a way to experiment without, with someone else running the game for a little while. Heck, you could even pick someone who's never read the rule book and kind of walk them through what to do. Like, what kind of adventures would you like to see? Which leads to my next suggestion, session, whatever you want to call it. Mid session zero session mid I, I don't know that the, so far no one's come up with a good name for this that I've heard. Unfortunately, I'm not coming up with any. But revisit things like your social contract, your lines and veils, your safety tools, where your campaign's going, the obligation. Make sure everyone still has enthusiastic consent and buy-in. This is a great chance to sit down. Now, note there's going to be a player missing. Right. So that's you may that that's the one issue with doing this while there's a player missing, but it's still worth talking about all this stuff and just getting a, another even just a quick reconfirmation. Everyone's still in. Everyone's still having fun. Do a quick um, um, with the thorns and roses. Right. What, what would you like to see more of? What did you like in the last couple of sessions? What didn't you like? And use that to drive your game going forward. Now, because a player is missing, don't make a huge, massive decision. Don't suddenly decide to like here. You add new lines and veils. You don't take them away without everyone there. Adding them is not going to hurt the player who's not there. Don't end the campaign. Don't decide to start playing something else with someone missing. But little things, right? Like, how's it been going? What do you want to see more of? Uh, when I ran 4th edition D&D, &D, one of the things in that game, yes, I know people sometimes hate this, there were magic item wish lists. So I would have everyone update their magic item wish list. So like, you know what? You know, Sean's not going to be here this week. And I was actually thinking of Sean, the other Sean. But... um because he played in that um we're gonna sit down and we're gonna update our wish list then we're gonna double check our math which was a thing in DD. we're gonna go through and make sure all our skills are at the right level and make sure all our bonuses and double check to make sure our ac is right we're gonna do all of that and then we're gonna play a quick game of red dragon in and we're gonna call it a night this week but that way when we come back next week at least all of you will be you know know your characters are up to date and everything absolutely yeah again you do definitely need to think about which direction you're going with this with a player missing uh, but I mean, I you know, th uh, roses and thorns or star or stars and wishes are mm -hmm. definitely something to get out there. Just make sure that you throw it out to that other player so that sometime during the week they can add their mm -hmm. own stars and wishes in there as well and, and you know, help fill things out. It's It's great for the team to do it, but you don't want, again, you don't want to punish. So give them a chance to, uh, to, to get their input, get their input yeah. in. So... This is kind of the next level tip, all right? So it, this is, again, it's, it's being proactive. It's if you know absenteeism is going to be a problem, whatever the reason may be. Again, we're not judging on why people are missing, but we know people are going to miss, possibly regularly, possibly often, maybe predictably, maybe not. Take that into account when you're picking what to play when you're doing uh again i'm not going to get into all these tools we're mentioning but like when you're doing cats that should be part of the description of what are we looking for in our place what kind of game do we want to play some games are designed so the players can drop in and out um one of the popular ones right now is what people call a west marches campaign in dungeons and dragons where you have a hex map you're exploring the hex map and every session ends back at the tavern so you're going to go out you're going to do something. You're going to come back to the tavern every session. And that way people can come and go. And a well-run West Marches campaign, I think, sounds amazing. And I wish I'd heard of this concept back in the day because most people run it as an open world sandbox with multiple groups running with different characters and affecting the overall world so that the, the DMs are all in contact with each other and making, you know, the updates on the map and noting, oh, that cavern's been evacuated. Oh, the ogre from here actually escaped and he now moved up into the forest up here and making it a very living world. But the big appeal of these games are is you can join any group with any GM anytime. 
and you don't have to come back. And the more often you play, the more you level up, the more stuff you do. But that's on you because it doesn't matter because you're not part of a coherent group that always does the same thing together every time. Though you could have a group that plays this way. But the idea, the theory of the West March is that you definitely don't have that and in a way discourages having the same groups playing together all the time. Now, even in games where it does matter who's there, you can change the style of play. Like I ran AD&D second edition for almost 10 years, sort of West Marches, but what it was, was my group were mercenaries. And whoever showed up that day got the mission and went and did whatever the mission was. Now, I will admit I wasn't really good at getting everyone back to town every time. So sometimes the group would change in the middle, but we always just assume something came up, right? Like you're mercenaries. Uh, you know, uh, you're you're sitting there trying to um, help some young kid defeat an evil empire. And then all of a sudden the crime boss comes in trying to settle his debt. Right. And you don't show up for a couple of weeks. And then the next time the party finds you, you're stuck in carbonite to <laughs> stick with today's theme. Um, another example of this is of, of games that work good for this is honestly, and I've never run it. So, yes, bad gamer cred Shadowrun. I am still fascinated that a game has been around this long that has such structured play because every shadow run session, if run by the books, is a run. It starts with meeting Mr. Johnson, who gives you a job. It groups miss like people from all over the place together to do that job. You then do the run. Then you report back to Mr. Johnson. You get paid. In the middle, it was where all the fun happens. But there is no reason you need to run with the same group every week in Shadowrun based on the premise of the game. And that's the premise of the game, not just how people run it. What I find odd is the number of people who run Shadowrun as a D&D campaign with the same group every week and everyone trying to fold the right roles. To me, that's not the fun to have in Shadowrun. To me, the fun is you're with this group this week and too bad because you're not getting paid unless you work together. Yeah, and I, I mean, I can absolutely see. I remember back in the days when we were playing Cyberpunk. Uh, mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, hey, I need a solo and I need a uh you know so a net runner uh and then we need some other people but you know i don't really care who they are as long as we can you know put a team on and and get something going mm -hmm. let's do it you know you don't have to be the heroes who are you yep. know you're you're just a bunch of people who are going out there and and getting things done another example is anything where you're working in the military you can do this uh which includes star trek because you get missions from starfleet as well as um uh your um cop stories right your 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 you know you've got a boss the the, the, the sergeant yeah, yeah, yeah police procedurals i was trying to see like i said i'm i'm missing <laughs> all the they're, they're coming to me but they're not there at the tip of my tongue tonight but yeah your procedurals so my last suggestion as far as what you can do is to specifically have a backup game so pre-plan this. And this is if you know you're going to miss people, know what you're doing. When we have seven players, we play this. When we have three players, we play this. Now, again, my problem I've had with this is sometimes the backup starts to become more popular than the original. That, that can be an issue. But in general, plan ahead of time. So, and I think this is the, the overall, I guess, my, my, my overall summation of this is be prepared for it and have a plan. And that plan should be done during session zero. Yep. <laughs> Everyone, you need you need the buy-in in advance. And actually, this is a really great one if you've got another DM in mm -hmm. your group. So swap off, you know, because DMs need breaks too. And they're they're the and if they're not there, that's a real problem. But if you've got multiple DMs, and I know we've got people in our Discord who have this, whereas mm -hmm. you know. If, if the if the right combination of people is there, they can run a bunch of different games because yep. they are, you know, a bunch of them are DMs, GMs, whatever you'd like to call it, and they all have different games they run. So, mm -hmm. who, so be it. Whoever happens to be there, the game is going to be running according to that. All right, and we do have one final suggestion that hasn't come up yet, which I still think is also just as valid as the rest. So yeah, this one for me is is something that especially a lot of these hardcore game groups, a lot of these groups who just are are so dedicated, which is fantastic. But at the same time, there's nothing wrong with the whole group just taking a night off. Mm -hmm. Don't game, spend some extra time with family, watch a new show, catch a movie. You don't have to game every Wednesday night at 8 p.m. 
there's a whole world out there. Maybe there's a concert, you know, maybe there's a band in town that you like. Mm-hmm. You never even would have known about if you hadn't realized that, oh, this Wednesday I get to do something other than go to place X and do game Y. Yeah. Totally agree. No, you could do something other than gaming with that same group of people as well. You sure. don't have to necessarily ditch everyone. Yeah. That can be a great way to get to know your players and the other people you game with all the time in a setting outside, excuse me, a setting outside of gaming. Yeah, doing something else and taking the night off doesn't necessarily mean you have to abandon the friends. It yeah. just means you're not playing the game and you know Though you're sometimes not having multiple groups of friends is a healthy thing. Very true. You may <laughs> want to get away from those friends for a little while. Very true. All right, I do have one other thing I want to mention. That while this topic is pretty much directly related to role-playing games and all the questions were role-playing specific, with the growing number of campaign-based games and legacy games out there and scenario games, this can apply just as much to board games nowadays. Now, the big difference here is board games are codified. There are rules and there are systems you have to follow for them to work. It's one of the things that is different. You don't get to improvise as much in your board games. And it's going to matter what game it is, what you can do. And I'm not going to get into all the possible things you can do with board games, but a lot of the above applies, like playing a different game, but you don't really get to play the same game with different characters doesn't work as well, though it does for some. Like certain games like Charterstone are designed specifically so players can jump in and out. Battles of Camelot is a game that people can jump in and out while you're playing it. But then other games, you can't be on chapter 17 of Descent Journeys in the Dark and then just suddenly take a character out unless maybe there's a way to like one player can try out multiple characters which honestly, I didn't recommend that above because I've never had that go well. I know some groups think it's okay. It, to me, that's a no-no. So if you want to do that, you can do it. Whereas in a board game, I'd probably be okay with it. But even then, I wouldn't want to show up the next week and find out my character died or you I, you lost my favorite weapon or you went and bought an ax, but I wanted to use spears. Like there's just too many loopholes with that. So it's going to be based on your game. But I just wanted to point out that what we talked about above, though it is an RPG focus, applies just as much to board games and i know people don't like to admit it but you should still have your session zero with your board game group as well absolutely so i think that's it for our suggestions on what to do when you're missing a player we're here to answer your gaming and game night questions if you got a question for us head over to the website click on ask the bellhop fire off an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or hit me up on social media where i can be found everywhere it's tabletop bellhop one word and if you use or do any of these suggestions we've got or if you've got other suggestions that we completely missed mm-hmm. when you've got mia players let us know in the comments in the yes. uh, social media wherever we're interested in how you handle this particular problem like if you got the you played someone else's character thing to work i, I actually kind of want to hear that story I also kind of want to hear the horror stories. There's something we've never asked for before. We ask for questions, but if people have horror stories, I, I, we could add a whole segment where we read out horror stories. That's been popular on other shows. I'm like, I, I have not ever had it go well, but if it works for you, all the power to you. Welcome to a read review of the One Ring Starter Set, a new RPG beginner box for the second uh, edition of the One Ring role-playing game. Thank you very much to Free League Publishing for sending us a copy of this box set to check out. Well, the One Ring Starter Set was designed by Marco Maggi and Francesco Nipitello, with additional development by Michelle Garboggio. Features adventures by James Spawn, maps from Francesco Nipoli, and fantastic artwork from far too many people to list here. Now, this new starter set, which is for the second edition of the One Ring role-playing game, was published by Free League Publishing in late 2021 after a very successful Kickstarter. It's designed to be played by a group of two to six players, and that includes the Lore Master, the GM role in this game. Now, the included adventure in Shire Swordsbook should provide many, many hours of gameplay, with each session expected to last about two hours, but multiple sessions in this box. Now, this very full and heavy RPG box set has a surprisingly odd MSRP of 4340 US. That is when buying direct for Free League. Though I gotta say, prices on online stores right now are all over the place. 
but the actual suggested price is 43.40 and that's uh, due to the translation from swedish kroners yes now if you weren't one of the 16,000 plus backers on kickstarter <laughs> where it raised almost 2 million us we'll help you decide if this is the game for you or if you did back it and put it on your role playing game shelf with all those other kickstarters We'll let you know if you should hurry to get that one to the table. Now, the One Ring Starter Set is a role-playing game beginner box. It's designed to introduce players to the second edition of the One Ring, which is, of course, a fantasy role-playing game set in Middle-earth. The world of J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, Hobbit, Silmarillion, and other works. It provides everything you need to play, including streamlined rules, ready-to-go characters, and an adventure that lets you take on the role of a group of hobbits experiencing their first taste of adventure note specifically for this box hobbits not humans elves dwarves or ants just the hobbitses now to take a look at all the components you get in this beginner box what i suggest is you check out the one ring starter set unboxing video that we have up on youtube um i had thought about holding up pictures you could see of these but this is also going on an audio podcast so the best way to see what you get is to check out that video now, since part of this review will highlight each of the components in detail, I'm not going to get into everything you get in the box here because we're going to talk about each of those. What I am going to say is that the component quality here is excellent. The books are well-bound soft cover books. The maps on thicker paper, almost cardstock level. The artwork here is amazing. Just what I want from a Lord of the Rings game. Uh, the Everything is, is excellent here. The writing is well done. I didn't see any grammar errors. Heck, they even use the inside of the box, like the, the inside, like not, not the stuff in the box, but like the, the covers and the back cover to squeeze in even more content than would fit normally. So let's take a look at each of the things you get in this Middle Earth role playing game starter box. All right. I didn't expect to want to do this, but this is the first time I think I've ever had this. I want to talk about the box. So first off, it's sturdy. It's nice and sturdy, uh, which most sets nowadays are, but I am so glad we are past the days of thin card boxes that honestly don't even last a week on your shelf. Now, it's not the main thing I want to call out there. What I want to highlight is what I just mentioned, the inside of the box. The box bottom has a map of the Shire with its four farthings and the, the areas around the Shire. And the box top has a rule summary as well as various tables you may need to reference during play. These together can be put up as basically a lore master screen when playing. And I've got to say, it's the first time I've ever seen this, and I think it's brilliant. So this was actually one of the last stretch goals for the Kickstarter, okay. was to get this work placed inside the box, specifically to be able to use this box as a kind of uh, makeshift DM screen. I, it is great. Like, I want to see more games do this. Uh, spoiler, I know one other that did. <laughs> um, so next, I want to bring up the the one problem I found with this set. And that is the One Ring Starter Set Dice. These are proprietary custom dice consisting of two 12-sided dice and six six-sided dice. Now, the D6s at first glance look like normal D6s. They have the numbers one to six, but there are a couple special features. The first is that the six also contains this little T-looking symbol, which is the elvish numeral for one on it. These elven ones are used to determine the degree of success when rolling. Now, the second unique feature on these dice are that numbers one to three are hollow and numbers four to six are solid. This is a reminder that comes up when your character is weary in the game. If you are tired, the one to threes don't count. Now, the D12 dice should contain the numbers one to ten, as well as Gandalf's rune on one side and the Eye of Sauron on the other. Now, I say should because, unfortunately, the physical dice actually have the numbers two to eleven on them. Now, this is a printing error and something Free League is well aware of and is working on getting fixed. If you do pick up this set and have misprinted dice, Free League will replace them for you if you wish. No, right now, they're just refixing it for the Kickstarter backers, but they will be moving on to everyone else. Now, personally, while I am disappointed by this error, I'm not sure it's worth forcing the company to accrue the cost of replacing these. You can just as easily read the 11 as a 1 when playing or just let the 11 count as 11. Because what Hobbit isn't excited about Elevenses? Plus, at least for this starter set, this is a game about hope and exploration. And I don't think adding a slightly better chance of success is really a bad thing for the game. Indeed, while I'm sure for Free League, this is a huge deal. 
It's going to be a major black eye for them internally, given the popularity of the Kickstarter and how many sets of these dice went out. Mm -hmm. However, it's also in the grand scheme of things, a staggeringly minor issue. Yeah. Now the one rank starter set comes with a beautiful, large two-sided eight panel. I don't know if you call it eight fold or eight panel when it's pulled out, you got eight panel maps. On one side, it has the Shire, as you'd expect. Now, the other side shows the region of Middle-earth called Iriador. Now, I never picked up the original version of the One Ring RPG. This is my first experience with it, but I learned from Pookie UK, uh, who's a very prolific RPG reviewer. Look them up. Uh, they do reviews from Relay, that there's a change in setting here from the previous edition of this RPG. So this map and this area has never been explored in the One Ring role-playing game before. Now, the original game was set in Rovanion, which is a region east of the Misty Mountains. Now, while I think the Shire map is awesome and it looks great and you're going to want to use it while playing the included adventure, um, in interesting ways is all I'll say. The map at Iriador is more useful for people who just want a cool piece of Lord of the Ring things and kind of see what the Shire is. It's not needed for anything in this box. But what it can be awesome for is for any group that moves on to the full game, because this is the core area of Middle Earth that this particular version of the One Ring will be exploring. Now, this map of Eridor could be a confusing adder, since, again, as we just said, it's not really useful in the starter box. But you don't get it without buying the starter box. Mm -hmm. So it's nice that they didn't waste the backside of the Shire map. And this actually is the first of many things you'll see that they did include in this box to make it useful for people playing the full game, which the next item in particular comes up are the item and stance cards. Now, first, I want to talk about the item cards. You get 30 of these. These feature artwork and the item name on one side and a description of the item and stats on the other. And I know there's enough gamers out there that hate cards in the role playing games. Personally, I love them. I love getting cards because it saves you having to look up stuff in the book while playing. And I've got to say, I also love the fact when you get item cards like this, you can actually have players build a tableau in front of them of what they have equipped at the time. And you know what's stowed and what's not. That's just something it's just easier to keep track of that way. You know, another valuable reason to get this particular set, as currently none of these card decks are available for sale separately. For now, we don't know if they're going to add them or not later. Next are the stance cards. These are bigger square cards. And these are specifically included, as it says in the book, for people who go on to play the core rulebook. Now, there is some simple rules for using the stance side of these cards, and it's really basic, but it doesn't even mention what the other side is for. And in looking at it and reading them, they seem to be about exploration and long distance travel, which anyone who's a fan of Tolkien's work knows that's going to be part of the game. Now, personally, I don't mind these. Like, really, they're a tease of something more. And I got to say, they seem like I'm going to want them if I do switch to the full rules. Now, unlike some of their other product lines, at least as we are recording this, they are really trying to push the bundle of mm -hmm. starter box and core book as the dice are currently the only component available separately from the starter box. And I will fully admit, full disclosure, I did get that bundle. That is, this is the only part of it I've touched so far, but I did get that bundle. Now, the starter set includes six hobbits for you to play. Uh, for those who care, that you have Roramac Brandy Book, Primula Brandy Book, Paladin Took II, Lobelia Bracegirdle, Esmeralda Took, and Drogo Baggins. Now, Middle Earth fans are probably going to recognize some of those names as relations to some more famous hobbits. In fact, it would be hard to think of anyone considering this purchase game, purchasing this game, not being somewhat familiar with the Tooks and the Brandywines, at least. Now, each character, she has a beautiful image of the character, a detailed description that actually includes some role playing cues, as well as ties to the other characters, which is always good to see in a game like this. The other side, of course, has the game information, your stats, skills, etc., Note one thing that you will not find in this box. There are any rules for character creation or character advancement. That is something that is not covered by this at all. The included adventures are designed specifically around these characters. And the number of characters included was another one of the stretch goals. Oh. Uh, the original plan was only to have three, which wow. seems a little odd as four players, uh, including the GM, including the lore master, uh, seems a bit low even for a starter box. 
Uh, I gotta say that that slightly concerns me because I plan to run the game with five players. <laughs> that might be more than this was intended. Now, in addition to the six hobbits, there are two other character sheets. Um, these are literally unlocked while playing the adventure. That is something else I have never seen in a role-playing starter set before. And I dig it. I love the, the, the fact that as you play, you can unlock more playable characters. Uh, the very video game-like, but hey. Um, as for what these characters are, uh, you're going to have to play the game to find out. Though if you want a spoiler, watch our unboxing. Unlockable content in your RPG, I like. Far mm. better than loot boxes, that's for sure. Yeah, the, the item deck is randomized when you get your Nona. None of that's going on. <laughs> All right. Here's what I know a lot of people are curious about the rules. The rules are presented in a book called The Rules, uh, which is only 24 pages long. You get the usual prologue, an example of play, which introduces the setting, which is specifically Middle Earth in the Shire around the year 2960, which is the Twilight of the Third Age, a period set between the events of The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. Bilbo's back with his treasure, but the fellowship hasn't been formed yet. Now the system in the One Ring involves a dice pool. This dice pool will always contain at least one of the D12 dice called feet dice. You're also going to add a number of D6 success dice based on what skills the character is using. You total these dice, you roll them all together and compare the results to a target number which is actually derived from the character's attributes of strength, heart, or wits, depending on what you're trying to do. Now, I got to say, this is quite different from most other popular role-playing games, especially fantasy ones, where the game master would be the one that sets the target number instead of it being a number determined by your attributes. Now, with the feet die, the Gandalf rune symbol represents an automatic success, so you always have a 1 in 12 chance to succeed. And the Ion Sauron, while not a automatic fail, does count as a zero. Now the elven rune on the D6, remember there's an elven one on the six side of the D6s, determines the degree of success on a successful roll with one rune meaning a great success and two or more meaning an extraordinary success. Now again, these are the simplified beginner box rules. There may be more variety to these dice in the full game. And again, even with the misprint on the feet die, your actual mathematical advantage gained is very minuscule. Uh, again, you've got an 8.3% chance of rolling any specific uh, face on the D12, mm -hmm. uh, or you you can add it. It's an overall shift of one higher if you if you count it as 2 to 11 instead of 1 to 10, which is really only going to bump your totals up a maximum of 5% on your, on, on your total chance of success, which is very minimal. And again, it's a game of hope. Very true. Sorry, I lost something. As expected, there are also systems for modifying the difficulty based on what's going on in the story. These include adding and removing success dice, as well as having a system for rolling two feet dice and keeping the highest or the lowest die due to favorable or unfavorable situations in the game. Now, fitting with the theme, there is also a uh, resource management kind of system of hope and inspiration, which allows players to add additional dice to their pool and has ways to both gain or lose both hope and inspiration while playing. Now, characters take damage or overburden themselves. They become weary, and that's where that one to three result on the success dice comes in where they don't count for your roll. Just goes to show there are seven meals in a day and skipping one can leave you out of sorts and weary. Now, the various player hero characteristics include the three attributes I've already mentioned, strength, heart, and wits. There's also distinctive features, which can be called on for inspiration, both in role-playing and mechanically with the inspiration mechanic. Uh, skills here, though, are very Middle-earth based and quite different from what you see in other fantasy role-playing games. You're going to find skills like courtesy, and hearten, explore, riddle, song, and travel, along with more typical skills like athletic, scan, and stealth. And of course, there are also combat skills, which are actually broken up into axes, bows, spears, and swords. And every player has a derived parry value. That is actually the target number that the opponents are rolling to hit in combat. So combat, but not just yes. combat. Yeah, actually combat is probably the least focused part of this game. Now, combat is here, and it is very abstract. You're not going to see any maps and minis and measuring distances here and possibly maybe more abstract than some players like. I'm not sure on that, though. 
His combat starts with one or more opening volleys, where combatants with ranged weapons can fire on either side. Then you shift to close quarter rounds once your groups have met each other. Now, in these, players individually will decide, are you going to fight in close combat or ranged combat? But you can't pick ranged combat unless at least two characters are fighting in close combat. Now, each close combatant is going to pick one enemy out of the group that's there to fight with. If there are more close combatant characters than enemies, you're going to pair up. So two of you will go against one enemy. If there are more enemies than characters, the lore master gets to decide what to do with the overflow, either having them pair up or they can have the baddies stay back in ranged combat or pair up against a single character. Now, attack rolls use the same system outlined above where you're trying to beat your strength target number and you're rolling under your appropriate weapon. And again, the bad guys are trying to roll your parry target number. Now, success symbols rolled on the success die. Those are those elven runes let you trigger special effects. Um, in this particular version of the game, and I assume there's more in the other, your options are do a heavy blow, do a piercing attack, or fend off the enemy. The ranged melee interaction, is, uh, or ranged versus melee interaction, is interesting, and I would love yeah. to see that play out, because it feels like it has some real party balance benefits. It sounds like there's going to be some interesting tactical options on both sides for who engages what. Yeah, like I said it's definitely out there. You're not measuring anything. You're not like who's exactly where. It's just, you know what? Bilbo's going to try to take out that warg and Frodo or Sam's going to try to keep the, the, the ring wraith at bay. And in the meantime, Peregrine's in the back with his boat. Yep. Now, damage in this system causes endurance loss. You're, you you got to have a hit point system in a fantasy role playing game. I guess it, you just can't get rid of it. Um, once you lose endurance, you are going to become wary. Eventually, if you hit your carrying load, so the amount you're carrying is affected by this, and eventually if you lose all your endurance, you're just knocked unconscious. Enemies are defeated when reduced to zero endurance, just to keep things simple, not the only game that's done this. Now, I mentioned one of the special effects are piercing blows. Those have the possibility of causing a wound, which can be prevented with armor, and there's a little die roll system based on what armor you're wearing. I'm not going to get into the details of that. Now, enemies are defeated after taking one room wound you wound it it's done doesn't matter how many endurance it has left that's important to note kind of like critical hits and other systems we like whereas characters can survive their first wound fine with some ongoing penalties but risk severe consequences if they take a second wound potentially causing the character to have to give up adventuring note one of those consequences that is not on the table is character death that is not something that is possible in this game a very modern and welcome take on combat outcomes to be sure. Now, the adventure book is the second largest book in the starter set, clocking in at 31 pages. You are not looking at one short one-shot adventure here. You are looking at a full story arc called the, the Conspiracy of the Red Book, which is designed specifically for the hobbits included in this box set. Now, this book is meant to be used at the same time as the Shire book, which also comes in the set, and I'll talk about in a minute, uh, to tell a five adventure story me to tell a five adventure story that begins with the player heroes meeting up with a rather eccentric hobbit known as Bilbo Baggins. Now these adventures are detailed enough that while each one could potentially be played through in a single session, there's enough meat there, especially when combined with the Shire book, that a lore master could easily stretch them out and turn the entire thing into a much longer campaign. You know, it's really nice to see that option out there for the lore master to choose from when it comes to adjusting game length. Now, overall adventure here is lighthearted and family friendly. You are hobbits doing things in the Shire and doing things while hobbits might consider quite dangerous really don't compare to your usual fantasy starter adventure. You're not going to find any monster bashing dungeon crawls here, but rather exciting adventures for any hobbit with a little bit of took in their blood as we all know hobbitses aren't the most adventuring sort by nature it would be quite unlike them to be fighting about something that didn't involve having to miss a meal now the final thing you get is that uh shire book i mentioned this is the biggest book of the bunch and i've got to say this surprises me this seems like a standalone product on its own it is a soft cover book at a meaty 52 pages this lets you know pretty much everything you want to know about the Shire and the history of the Shire and Hobbits. In addition to providing history, geography, you also get a ton of potential story prompts and 
inserted game rules, I guess we'll call them. Um, you're going to find a table and rules for Hobbit walks. Because trust me, it's Lord of the Rings. You're going to be walking. There's multiple in gossip tables. There is even a table in case the characters happen to ask about what Gandalf's been up to. You're going to have encounter tables and then details of landmarks and Hobbit families and the Matham House and Hobbiton and the, the, the cornerstone that marks the four farthings and so on. There is plenty going on in the Shire as presented in this book, enough to fuel many adventures, both during and potentially after you're done playing the adventure book. That is a lot of stuff. Yeah. So now that we know what you get in this RPG beginner box, what are your overall thoughts about the game? So I, I'm impressed. Like, I, I am very impressed with the One Ring starter set. This is honestly one of the most impressive RPG box sets I've ever had the pleasure of checking out, and I have checked out a lot of starter sets over the years. As any regular listener will know, you do have a love of starter boxes. Yes, I do. Now, physically, this is a beautiful Middle Earth product. Everything is designed in an appealing and easy to use way. There's artwork aplenty and the layout and graphic design flow and work really well. The editing appears to be great, though I would really like it if the books had an index um, or just like one index for the full set. Other than that, I didn't really notice any issues during my read through and later rereading before I published this review. Uh, the only problem with production I found, honestly, is the printing error on the D12, which I already mentioned. I don't think we need to get into again. Sadly, the inclusion of an index in these in RPG products has been more and more something of an extra rather than mm -hmm. a basic expectation in a book. Now, I suspect for Free League in particular, the primary reason is that with any purchase of the One Ring, any of the different One Ring core set, starter box, etc., they give you full PDF copies, and you can always just control F. True enough. Still, would have liked an index. To me, that's a to me that's a must have. That that to, to, that's a bigger issue to me than the D12 being wrong. Though I'll see just how bad it is referencing a dream play. Now. Middle Earth's big, right? Like, like the lore of Middle Earth, the world Tolkien created in the languages is long and broad, and that really shows in this product, especially in the Shire booklet. Now, I'm a fan of Tolkien's work. I've read the most of the primary works, but I'm no uber fan. I've got to admit that reading through the Shire booklet took me a long time. Uh, it gets quite dry at times and honestly did remind me of reading some of Tolkien's books, including knowing what type of flowers are growing on the bush by the side of the road. Um, I got to say, though, big time Lord of the Rings fans will probably eat this up and devour this book and love it. I will say it did seem to be a bit much. I will admit when I run the game, I will probably be a little more vague and reference this book for general themes and feel rather than specific steps or locations of certain rocks. There are some seriously deep facts here. Tolkien fans will not be disappointed. I think it's pretty fair to say that this is a Cimmerillion level depth on the Shire in on the Shire. specifically. Yeah, I can totally see that. Though I am sure there's still more out there that isn't in the book as well. Now, as for the system, I, it sounds very solid. Um, I really like the fact that you have that feet die. That is a neat thing. It reminds me of the control die in the classic sci-fi role-playing game Alternity from TSR. Yeah, I know, deep cut here. But I always liked it because that game, you always roll a d20 and then another die based on your stat. And I love the fact that it was they were using the scientific method of a control die. You always have a 1 to 20 chance modified by your skill. I, I thought that was fantastic. And I like that it's in this. It, it fits. And I actually even more like that it's a d12 because you don't have quite the the linear curve as you did well technically it's a d10 um i also like that they have um most people are going to know it as the dmd inspiration system where favorable conditions you roll two fate dice and take the highest and unfavorable you take two feet dice and roll the less i have enjoyed this particular mechanic in every rpg i played or run that uses it and there are multiples out there uh the endurance and mood system seems very suited to this particular setting um and so does the the resource of hope which can be gained, lost, or spent, and inspiration. And like reading through the module, there's really interesting things where like when things aren't going well, all your characters start losing hope. And to me, that is a something that ties it to the, the source material really well. 
So you know, really, you're getting a solid system with some known features used mm-hmm. in reasonable ways to play out your adventures with. Now, one note I don't know anything about is one of the things I do like as a dungeon master, and one of the reasons I prefer D100-based systems is I like knowing the odds. I have no clue what the odds are in this game whatsoever of doing anything. D12 plus possibly another D12 and a number of D6s added together to beat a target number. I, I, As a DM, I do like to know the odds, but you know what? I don't know if it's going to matter because one of the most unique things in this system is the target number system. I am so used to the DM having to assign a difficulty to everything you do. In your D100 system, are you rolling this stat while well, you're getting plus 10 and minus 10, whatever? It's going to take me a while to get used to just going, roll the thing. And the player being able to tell me if they succeed or fail, instead of having the player have to tell me what they rolled and me tell you if they failed or not. This system, though, does seem like it's going to reduce latency. Yeah, no, not having to request a target number and wait for the GM to work it out is certainly a nice feature for any game. Uh, yep. I, I, the last the last uh, superhero system I played prior to masks, I had to come up with VCs and I I. No, I don't like it. (laughs) (laughs) Now, the one thing that totally surprised me about this box set, and I just did not expect, is the amount of useful material for players who don't plan on ever playing the starter set. For people who just want to dive into the full One Ring experience with the nice hardcover rulebook. In addition to this being like a great gateway to the One Ring, I honestly think this is also... Like, it's two products at once. It's also the Shire expansion for the One Ring. Overall, the One Ring starter set is a fantastic RPG beginner box. As someone checking out the One Ring for the first time, this honestly contains everything I think I would want in a starter set to let me experience the world for the first time, including a whole lot more I would have never thought I wanted. If you and your group are at all curious about the One Ring 2nd Edition, this is the obvious place to start. In this box, you get everything you need to play, including simplified rules, pre-generated characters, a starting adventure that's so detailed it could be the basis of an entire campaign, maps, reference cards, and more. Uh, Yeah, it's very clear that the best choice for people who are trying to really delve deeply into this setting in an RPG and who didn't go in on the Kickstarter is to buy the bundle, the core rules and the starter set. You're definitely going to get the most bang for your buck. Now, if you're a fantasy role-playing game fan looking for a different take on fantasy role-playing, one about discovery, whimsy, interaction, and exploration with less focus on simulation or combat, I think you're going to find a lot to like in this box set. This is definitely not your typical dungeon crawling role-playing game, which honestly fits a game set in Middle Earth and based on Tolkien's work. Now, for those of you who aren't a fan of Tolkien, you probably want to avoid this one. The game is pretty much dripping with Tolkien lore and is fully steeped in the themes and settings of his books. If you haven't read The Cimmerillion, or at least tried intentionally to read The Cimmerillion, (laughs) For fun, probably not. Now, hack and slash, kill the monsters, get their stuff so I can kill bigger monsters and badder monsters and get even bigger and better stuff to kill more. You are probably not going to like this game. This is probably not for you. Well, it's possible the full one ring rules may support the style of play. You're not going to find that in this box set. Yeah, murder hobos aren't part of the Hobbiton world. Murder Hobbits may be in the full one, but definitely not in this box. set. Now, the one group, again, I was surprised that may be interested in this box are the people who already picked up the One Ring, who already play it, or people who went and picked up the full game and are planning on playing. Because in addition to being a gateway to the game, this works as a Shire expansion. I, this is a Shire setting in a box. If you plan on including the Shire in any of your One Ring games, This set's going to be worth picking up, even if you never use it as a beginner box or use the NPCs or play the adventure. Plus, you're going to get that extra stuff like the cards and the map that you don't get anywhere else. Yeah, the um, as I said before, unless they start releasing pieces separately at, at, at a certain point, the starter box is really the only way to get a lot of this content now that the Kickstarter is over. An interesting choice. I just think they expect everyone to start with it. 
So, which is probably fair. Now, as for me, my next step is going to be sitting down and actually playing through the adventures. Now, I do have the full core rulebook, but I'm not even going to touch it. I don't want it to blend into my games of playing the starter set. So that's going to go on the shelf for now. And I'm going to sit down and I'm going to run the Run Ring starter set with my friends and family. It's something I hope to start in the next month or so. And when that starts, I'll be sure to be talking about it here on our podcast and on social media streams. Until then, remember, not all those who wander are lost. Well, that's it for our review of the One Ring Starter Set. What's your favorite RPG beginner box? Let us know in the comments below. Now, for a more detailed look at this box set, I invite you to check out my written review of the One Ring Starter Set over at tabletopbellhop.com, which will also include some more pictures of the components so you can see everything you get. And now the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. Okay, so I got quite a few to talk about this week. Um, hopefully, the, I, I think I'm not going to ramble as much as last week, so this shouldn't take us too much past midnight. So I'm going to start off with Charterstone. It was game nine. Uh, for anyone who knows Charterstone, knows what game nine's all about. This is one of the landmark games. This is one of the ones you see everyone talking about. And all I will say is that all of us managed to keep the king happy, which I think is honestly going to be quite rare for other groups out there especially based on some of the comments I've already seen. Um, I really liked the added tension in game nine, and I can now officially say I called it in regards to the twist at the end. And unfortunately, not much I can say here, having only played a little bit and not being able to reference the twist, even though I know what you had called. Yes. <laughs> you know what I called. You know what's happening. It's interesting, as all I'll say. Game 10 is probably going to be impossible to talk about, except for it was good or bad. Yep. Um. After Charterstone, Tor, D, Cat, and I played a four-player game of Ex Libris. I talked about this one last week. Uh, this is only our second play and the first time playing with four, which I got to say is significantly better than when it was just D and I, but not to say it was bad with two. Actually, it's perfectly fine with two, but this is a worker placement game, and those are always more interesting when there's more competition for spots. And what I really liked with four is there were more uh, more locations available, more different places you could go to get your books. Um, we also found that many of the asymmetric abilities were more powerful with more players. Like for one, Deanna played a gelatinous cube in the two-player one, which was if someone else goes to your spot, they have to give you a card. But with two players, it was easy for me to avoid their spot, whereas with four, that wouldn't be as common. Overall, the game went great. Um, I didn't even mention what this is about. So this is the game about building a library in a fantasy world. And you have your gnomes you send out to do things, and you have your apprentice with unique ability. Um, more about this as we play more. Um, I liked it. Tori and Kat loved it. They really enjoyed this one. Um, I am really digging it. Deanna's really digging it. Not only is the theme great, but like the gameplay is excellent. Um, honestly, assuming at the end of the year we do a best new games of 2022, I know it's not a 2022 game, but it's new to me. I, I expect this to be on that list. Yeah, it's great to hear. Uh, hopefully I can give it a try sometime before uh, those lists come out for us. Yeah. Um, you know, this game is is really looking so solid uh, for people who weren't aware when it came out in 2017. It then went on to win uh, Origins Best Card Game, Mensa Select. Wow. Uh, and uh, Golden, it was nominated for Best Board Game Artwork and Presentation uh, for Golden Geeks. So, yeah. See, that's, I didn't even know what were in awards. I, this is one I happened upon by picking up someone's collection. Right. And it was just in a pile of other games. And I'm like, eh, I've heard it. Looks like it's about libraries. Again, don't be scared of the rule book. Most of it's reference. Uh, next up, we visited Pompeii and tossed lots of cylinders into Vesuvius as we introduced Tori and Kat to the classic downfall of Pompeii. No, we did not use the tea light. Uh, I really enjoyed this play. Um, what was unique to this game that hadn't happened in my play so far is the eruption card, the final, like, there's a big deck building thing at the beginning, like, sorry, not deck, I don't know what to call it. It's deck set up, to not confuse it with deck construction or deck building. You have to set up the draw deck at the beginning of the game, and it's a pain, you like make all these piles and stuff. Well, it randomizes when the end of the game hits and when the volcano starts erupting. And while both of those came up earlier than we expected, and none of us had all that many people on the board. Like we had a lot of people that just never got played. And it made the end score very tight. Like the winning player only had seven escapees 
and they tied. So we actually got to use the tiebreaker, which works fine with more than two players. So uh, overall, this is one of those games that, that we're enjoying. It's light. I, I hate call it light and fluffy when it's about people dying. That's the problem with this game. There's a confliction here with it. It's family friendly. Play with kids. But people died by pyroclastic flows. Yay. It, it's strange. But anyway, it, it's one of these games that, that that's light enough that Tori was like, oh, this will be great for Ma Dome. Um, the, her, their mom really enjoys like not lighter fare, but not mass market. Like they dig hobby games, but they want to keep it at a certain level. Um, they're probably going to try to find a copy of this. And last we looked, looking online, it looks like Princess Auto still has copies. So <laughs> if anyone in Canada is still looking for Downfall of Pompeii, you should be able to get this one cheap. Yeah, despite being an older game, it's just a solid concept and maybe not ideal for two players, no matter what they say on the box. I wouldn't ever play it again, two players. Next up, we are still working on the pile of shame. It's been a while. It's getting down there. It's still a long way to go. <laughs> um, the first game being Discover Lands Unknown. Uh, this is that procedurally generated board game from Fantasy Flight that came out the same time as Keyforge, where every copy of the game is guaranteed to be different from every other copy. Now, for those who care, our particular set had the valley and bayou terrain types. I guess that's one of the big differences, is what two terrain types you get. So my first issue with this game is getting it set up for the first time to play. As you can see in our unboxing video, which isn't actually live yet, but when it does go live, you'll get to see it, is that the box contains all kinds of, or is it live? I don't think this one's no, live. Not yet. Yeah, all kinds of card packs with cards of different sizes, with QR codes on them, which I think we're just used to scan them to put them in the box, all with different backs and just piles of cards. Unfortunately, the rules for the game aren't very clear what you're supposed to do with these cards. What it tells you is when setting up the first game, use this train book. And when setting up these games, use this other train book. And then when you look in the train book, it says, take all the cards listed. And it shows pictures of card backs. And it says, like, take certain numbers, like take cards 1 to 80 of this deck and take cards 187 to 27 in this deck or whatever. The problem is when you open everything and sort all the cards, like were some of those packs supposed to go with the different terrain or what? And we end up with duplicates. So we had cards number one to 80 coming from different packs. So I have no idea how these were distributed. And then we got numbers that were duplicated and numbers missing, which I, I get it's procedurally generated. So I guess that makes sense. And some of the duplicates make sense because there's actually like a list that says, if you have multiple number three cards, shuffle them, select one at the start of each game, which is cool because I guess that would give you random elements that would change every time you play. But we had duplicates of cards that aren't part of that. And honestly, one of them was a duplicate of a card that in the first game you need to go find. And both cards were identical. Like why? I'm, I'm going to spoil something because I don't even know if spoilers matter in this game. Why do I have two copies of the cabin? When both do the same thing, they have the exact same text. Like, like was that a mistake with the procedural generation? I, I don't know. And then part of this game is crafting. You get these plan cards. Well, it tells you to include the plan cards. Well, these were very obviously split into two separate packs. And I have to assume one's for each train type. Were we supposed to combine those and use them all in the first game? Or was I supposed to somehow know which came with which? Yeah, so during the unboxing, I managed to learn a lot about of the generation of these games and the way they were randomized and distributed and, and all the differences. But I, no one actually asked me how to figure out how you played. So I learned about the wide range of lands and the differences between boxes, but I didn't learn anything about how to play. Yeah, I, I strongly suspect that uh, cracking all the decks of cards was not the correct choice. Well, there was nothing telling us not to. so. I don't know. So once we did get all the cards sorted the way we thought we were supposed to, we played the first scenario, and here's where things start looking up. It was actually really enjoyable. Um, actually, really solid. Um, in Discover Lands Unknown, you wait your character, randomly picked character. You don't play the same character every scenario, which is kind of weird. You wake up in the middle of the wilderness on some random type of wilderness. Uh, for us, it was the valley, with no memory of where you are or how you got there. It's then up to you to survive with the actual goal of the game being to live. And that's it, which is interesting because like that's the goal of the whole box. After all five scenarios, did you live? Which is, is neat because it may or may not be cooperative. 
because your goal is to live. So that could mean everyone having to work together and pool resources so you all live. But then maybe you want to hoard all the water so that you don't die of dehydration. Like, it, I, I thought that was really neat. I, I actually thought it was kind of fascinating. And even the rules, like, don't want to call it. They're like, it's not purely cooperative, nor is it competitive. And it's true. Like, it really was kind of that gray area in between, which was really neat. I have to say, I'm kind of jealous, given that half of the video games I've been playing in the last year and a half or so are also described in the exact same manner as what you there just you explained. Well, one of the things that's important is that you could play this. This is not, we're not marking anything up. This isn't actually a legacy game. There are five scenarios, but there's no campaign. And as I already alluded to, like, you don't even play the same character when you play scenario. Well, you might, because it's randomly generated over deck. I played a sushi chef, which meant I could eat raw meat as cooked food. That was my ability when I played. So starting off in this, you're, you're kind of thrown into the game with no information and possibly badly sorted cards. Um, all you know is you need to find food and water and figure out what's going on. Now, the only other direction we were given was to flip the card that set everything up once we found a specific spot in the map, which we, of course, couldn't see because all the hex tiles are face down. Now, the game overall, I got to say, was fascinating and rather tense. It just felt like you were always uh, going to starve or run out of food or get mauled by a bear. Um, we loved the exploration aspects, and the mechanics are actually really solid. It's got a whole system with looking up cards and that, but it does neat things. Like, like, look up a card, but if you have this item, you actually draw the card too higher. Like, there was some really neat stuff going on with decks, which honestly really reminded me of some of the escape room games we've been playing. Like, a mix of the Coded Chronicles with some of the unlock stuff. Now, what I really want to know is how different the various copies of the game are. And I'm so worried about spoiling things. Like, can I spoil things? Or is every scenario one and every box the same, but on different terrains? Like, do you have the same twist we had at the end? Which, because I got to say, that one shocked me. I, there was no Charter Stone prediction here. I was like, what? Seriously? Or, like, is, is it unique that we had that ending? Or is there like six different possible endings of one and we got one of the six possible or there's 700 possible? I honestly want to know if anyone's played scenario one, hit me up and direct messages because I don't want to spoil it so I can compare notes because I want to know. So while I don't want to spoil anything for anyone, they aren't all the same. It depends on the terrain you've got. And that's kind of all I can say based on, on what I know yeah. about what's going on. So I don't want to spoil anything for you or other possible players. Or other players. The I said, I just, the end of scenario one, I want to know if it ends the same as us. Especially if you've got the valley terrain. I would love to know if the valley ending is always the same. Now, here's the thing I am concerned about, right? So this was a ton of fun. Because we're sitting there and we're playing through the valley. And by the end of the game, we had flipped every tile. I will admit, we did not check out every detail in every tile, but we did hit most of them. Now, scenario two, we're going to use the Bayou map. So it, again, it'll be all new experience, all new stuff on the map, all new exploration. Well, after that, you're going to know what's there. And why do I want to play game three where I go back to the valley where I already know what's in the giant tree and I already know what the spot with the, the, the glasses on it is for. And I, like, I don't know, are, are we even going to want to play? And then there's the weird st weirdness here that it's not a campaign. Like you are supposed, they suggest you play the scenarios in order, but you don't have to. You, we could replay scenario one again each time you get a random character, and I gotta say, it came with a ton of characters. Like, I do get it plays four, but there were more than eight. Like, like you wouldn't, in a four-player game, you're not even going to see all the character options, and everyone picks one or two. So there's a chance you'll never see a character. Like, I just, I don't know, I worry about the longevity of this game, and, and how would it, because it was fascinating, because it was all new. But once I'm back in the same map, and I'm like, well, I don't need to go there, because I don't know need the thing that I know I'll get if I go there. Is that going to ruin it? I guess we'll learn. Uh, both how much fun it still is, as well as how much of a continuous story it is. Because it seems really weird to me to play a campaign and not play the same character in game two. So I think you're playing a different group of people lost in a different terrain. I don't know. Uh, maybe this weekend we'll at least get to game two and I'll have some more thoughts on that. So this game is very different. And here I'm not going to say anything that isn't covered in the front of the rule book, as, as far as my understanding goes. As you continue to play with different characters... Yeah. The greater story reveals itself to you, the player, not to the characters. 
So okay, you're meant to think of it sense. as a TV series or a novel where a number of different groups of characters are caught up in something far bigger than them. Uh, as long as it doesn't end with we're all dead and this is our version of heaven, I'm all good with it. No Because it does no have smoke. that feel. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, there's a, I haven't found a smoke monster yet. <laughs> So the next game to come off the pile of shame was Spell Smashers. Note I'm going to take my time saying that because I just want to screw it up every time and I haven't yet. I, even when we went to play, I'm like, oh, no, we should play tonight. Smell Smashers. I don't know why I want to say Smell Smashers, but it's Spell Smashers. And this was excellent. I, this was another surprise hit, um, kind of like Ex Libris. Now, honestly, we mentioned this game on the show actually a few times. This has shown up multiple times as an honorable mention for us. Um, best party games, best word games, game, educational games for kids that teach them spelling. Like we've, we've kind of mentioned this a few times. And honestly, I'm not going to do it and go back and re-edit the lists on the blog. But this would move from an honorable mention to an actual recommendation on every single one of those lists. Now, this is a mashup of card-driven spelling game and dungeon crawl. You put out some monsters who are each represent a letter, which is the first letter of their name. So the vampires of E. Uh, you get a hand of consonants and vowels. And they, the cards have suits of either fire, ice, or earth. And each has a damage number. And most of the, like, the common numbers do one damage, or the uncommon numbers do more. Kind of like your, your Scrabble numbers. You then are going to spell a word with your hand. Now, you're going to just, like, there's a little card to say, I'm ready, I'm not. So you wait till everyone's ready, then you reveal. And you're supposed to do it like a battle cry. So you're supposed to be like, whatever, effervescent 12 or whatever. I don't know how many letters are in effervescent. It's probably not 12, it's probably eight. And you're supposed to yell it out, which actually was quite fun because we insisted you do that while we played. Um, then whoever has the biggest word gets initiative for the round. They pick one of the monsters and play and hit them for the amount of damage their word contains. This is represented by um, coins. Their health is coins. So if I did eight damage, I take eight coins. Now, if you kill the monster, sorry, you then take the coins. If you kill the monster, you, you collect it. It's worth points at the end of the game, and then you can use it. So if you kill the vampire, you now have a V you can use every round. Well, thankfully, the vampire at least does three wild damage, so it, you can choose what type of damage it is. Um, then the monster's going to do damage back, whether you killed it or not. This is a pretty typical deck-building thing where you're going to draw punitive cards that end up in your hand. The thing is, these are more letter cards, but they have multiple letters on them. So you've got your pretty standard S, T, I, N, G, but you're also going to have like H, I, and like H, Y or something, right? Like they're not necessarily easy to use, but they do make it so you can make bigger words. So it might help you to get initiative in the next round. So there's a neat balance thing going on there. Um, then the next player gets to hit a monster and so on. You're going to go back and forth and you're going to collect all your gold. And then... Um, you're gonna gonna um i skipped ahead something here so you get you collect all your gold then you're gonna spend these you then go to town and you get to go to one of the buildings in town you either get side quests which you can kind of turn in and these are things like spell a, a do at least 12 damage in one hit or spell a word with seven consonants or whatever like they're just little things that you're trying to complete like personal goals uh, you can go shopping for gear you draw two gear cards and pick one you can have one weapon and one armor equipped Armor tends to prevent wound cards from gathering, whereas weapons do all kinds of stuff, like doubling damage, giving you extra abilities, giving you wild card consonants, and so on. You can buy potions. There's three different types, which change your damage type, let you use a wild card. Um, I can't remember what the third one is, but it doesn't matter. Uh, you can go see the alchemy, or the, I can't even remember who it is. The druid, I think it is, to heal wounds. Um, one of my favorite actions is go to the pub and spend money to earn beer for all your wounds. So you go in and brag about your wounds. Overall, this is a really well done. The theming is excellent. Both Deanna and I were really impressed by this one. And I was shocked when I actually won a word game versus Deanna, who honestly tends to trump me at these games. She says she just got worse cards. She, she blamed it on the randomness of the deck. I don't know. I, maybe I was just on my game. I personally think it was date night and she threw it so I wouldn't get grumpy. <laughs> now i'm looking forward to playing this one more um i want to try this with more players because with with two players there's only two monsters i want to see what happens when there's more monsters out and um if we do play this weekend i think brenda deanna's mom is really going to dig this one uh plus i think tori and cat will probably like it as well all right well it's good to hear that it does really does belong in those lists we've been uh suggesting it should be in 
Now, speaking of playing this on Sundays, yes, I did spell exhalant. That was one of the words I came up with. That used up three wounds. Um, speaking of Brenda, Sunday we played a game of Garinto. Uh, we used the five player rules, the dragon tiles, and the season of change variant. And I got to say, this seems to be the perfect combo. I really dug this particular combo when playing Garinto. Game went well. Everyone enjoyed themselves. Um, this was the first time the kids and Brenda got to see the dragon tiles. Everyone liked those. Those are they're wild. So when you draft them, you either put them where you want, or when you're using them to take tiles, you get to pick their element. Uh, at this point, based on the groups I play with, I think I'm just going to leave them in the bag from now on. Fair enough. It really is hard to find bad things to say about Garinto. What I've been enjoying is other people discovering it through us. I now have a couple people have been calling us out and pointing out to like, oh my God, I finally tried it. It's so good. And I love seeing that. Yeah. I'm still, I'm going to keep advocating for this game until everyone's got a cup. Now, finally, I got the Quacks of Quedlinburg with the Herb Witches expansion at the full player count of five for the first time. Now, it's only my second time using Herb Witches, and there were some issues. Um, I'm starting to have mixed thoughts. Now, before I get into the problems, this is still, in my opinion, a must-have expansion so far. I love the rules for the witches, which break the rules and help you mitigate the randomness. I love the overflow pot, so you actually get to do something if you get to the end of the pot. The local weed is a catch-up mechanics great, and I love having new books for the existing ingredients as well, which just really ups the amount of replayability of the game. What I'm not loving are the six pumpkins, despite the fact everyone else seems to love them. During this game in particular, the second round, we drew a fortune card. These are things you draw at the start of the round that, that sets things up for the next round. Well, it let you discard any two rubies to take any ingredient. Well, of course, the players that could afford it took six pumpkins in the second round. These normally cost 22. There is no way anyone in the second round should be able to buy a six pumpkin. And because of this combat combo, we had a huge is the word I put in the notes, but I will say a ridiculous runaway leader problem. The last round had us looking all over the internet, trying to figure out how to calculate rat tails. This is a catch-up mechanic where you check how many rats are between you and the leader on the scoreboard. Well, someone lapped the scoreboard twice. Not finding anything, we assumed you just count them all, going around and around the board till you finally catch up, which is weird because the rats are spaced out at the beginning and closer together at the end. So like, it just didn't seem like it should have worked this way. And Deanna, who happened to be in last place, had 46 rat tails. She started the next round with her pot full. All she had was pulling stuff and putting it in the overflow pot, which doesn't activate any of the ingredients. And I got to say, this felt very broken. This one was really weird. And I did some Googling as well that night when you posted to Twitter about it. And I could not find yeah. anyone describing this problem uh, or any problem anywhere near as significant no. as this one. So I'm just not clear how it managed to get so bad. I, I don't know. Six pumpkins. Like, like. So the one player was scoring 12 to 15 points every round, every round, every round. And then using the, the witches to double their points once. And it, it was bad. Now, I don't know. To, to me, what it felt like is, is, is a flute combo, right? That combo of the new ingredients, the fortune teller cards, and maybe the witches that could cause a problem like this. Like maybe this is a one in a thousand, maybe a one in five or 10,000 chance that this particular combo happens. But because it did happen, I'm a little concerned. And I keep going over the game in my head, trying to figure out, did we do something wrong? And I haven't found anything yet that we did wrong based on the rule book. And unfortunately, I didn't get any replies to my tweet. So like you said, I don't think it's happened to anyone else. So I don't know what happened there. Yeah, it's it's really weird. I I don't know. Um. Yeah, I'm not sure. Like, like there should just be a rule that there's a max number of rats. I don't know. Now, pumpkins cannot be upgraded. Yeah, but this was take take right. any one shit. Right. Knowing pump, we did screw that up. Actually, we did upgrade pumpkins because there was a thing, a fortune teller card that said upgrade one. Yeah, pumpkins can never be upgraded. But it, that by that point, everyone had pumpkins, and like a couple people did it. It wasn't that wasn't part of that problem, right? So we might have messed that up, but like this was because in round two, 
someone was able to take a pumpkin. Now, the pumpkins also killed it. And the fact that one of the witches we had out let you duplicate a purchase you just made. So that person who was in the lead stayed in the lead, had more money than everyone else, and was the first person to be able to buy pumpkins. And as soon as they bought a second pumpkin, they used the witch to get three. So now they have three pumpkins in their bag and no one else has any. Right. And it just compounded. Like pumpkins are six. Like they go six. It doesn't, yeah, you so get three pumpkins out and you're near the end of the pot. There, there are a number of people who consider the six pumpkins uh, overpowered, but yeah. it, it the, the upgrading thing is definitely something to watch out for. No yeah. pumpkin cards can be upgraded. Well, that's good. Now, I'm also thinking you can't take a six pumpkin when it says take any one ingredient. Like that might yeah, be I'm the house sure. rule. I don't know. If anyone else had this problem, please let me know what you did. Like, I, I don't know what... what I'm, it, it was it was on it's like i still had fun because it's kind of fun game like it's the push your luck and i got to see how well i did but like overall it was not the best quacks experience right now finally i do want to mention one other thing about herb witches and that's playing with five players honestly in my head you had another player who cares it's just not going to be any longer because everyone pulls from the bag at the same time right and people are going to blow up at random times adding another player is not going to do anything but you know what jesus but you know what it does um the only cause I can think of is the shopping phase because there is some AP there, right? Like there's, you're doing a bit of math. You're going, I've got 23 to spend. I want one of those eights, which leaves me with this. So I can buy this or this. Can I read that card again? Okay. Yeah. I'll buy that. I'll multiply that by the eight rounds in the game. And it can be a significantly longer game than I thought. So just fair warning, make sure that you realize that having a fifth player, like you're talking half an hour, 45 minutes, maybe even an hour longer with one more player just because the game is so many rounds. Yeah, so I think part of it is going to be lack of knowledge. I mean, once oh, yeah. you once you know your cards and you know the values and things better, uh more experienced players would have a better idea of what they were going to buy with whatever they had uh yeah. in advance and wouldn't need to, you know, read the cards and such as much. Well, plus we're playing with my kids, so I had to like reiterate like, "Oh, what'd you end on? Okay, you got that much. Remember that means you can buy two ingredients, you can't buy the same ones." But yeah, it's it's definitely you do have more people there and you're looking at more people's things and what to buy. Yeah. All right. Well, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? Uh, so to follow up from last week, uh, we did talk to Tori and Kat about playing the one ring once we finished Charter Stone. So that's good to go. Uh, but it's going to be a bit. We still have three games of Charter Stone left at this point. We're only getting one game in a session so far uh, lately for these later rounds. And I know we're missing at least one game night coming up due to being out of town. So it's coming. We're, we are going to switch over to a role-playing game, and you'll get my final review of Charter Stone, but it's going to be a little while. So I got to say, it's going to be nice to finally have a steady RPG going again. It's it's been more than four years. It might even be five years at this point. So that'll be nice. Um, board game-wise, I am looking forward to trying Scenario 2 and Discover Land Unknowns. I want to know what's going on. I'm looking forward to exploring the bayou because it'll be unique. What I'm not sure is if I'm going to look forward to number three after that, but we'll find out. Um, next weekend, I think we'll probably, this weekend, sorry, not next weekend, this weekend we'll probably wrap up Star Wars Unlock. We have one game left to do that. That's probably what we're going to bring uh, to Brenda's on Sunday. And we may review um, the Star Wars Unlock box with its three adventures next Wednesday. That's, that's on my track to be reviewed. Um, but I am going to double check, see where we are for pile of obligation and so on. Um, I plan on starting to read the One Ring Lore Master screen and Rivendell source book that comes with it, uh, because if I am going to run the game, even if the screen is for the full rules, I think it's going to be useful, and it's going to look nicer than the box <laughs> tops and bottom there. Though I still think it's cool, I'd rather have a nice screen. Um, if we can fit it in, I'd love to play some more spell. See there, spe did I? I think I said spell. <laughs> spell Smashers. Um, with both our regular group and maybe, just maybe, Dan and I can get something else off the pile of shame this Saturday, but I don't have anything picked out or planned at this point. All right. Well, that is a lot of play on the way. Now, a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Lucas, thank you. Evil John. Thanks, Mr. Carney. Donna, thank you, our personal paladin. Uh, Valentine Pesh. Pash, thank you. I never got a clarification. Pache, Pash, please let me know if we're getting that wrong. Matt Lichtenwaller, thank you, Matt. Well, that was the double bell. 
That means our shift's coming to an end, and it's going to be time to lock those front doors. Well, the doors for the lobby are closed. You can always find us all over the web as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can visit our website at tabletopbellhop.com. Find our podcast on your podcatcher of choice. Sign up for our newsletter at some place or other for weekly updates. Oh, that still works. <laughs> you Tabletop. can go to our newsletter at tabletopbellhop.com. It's just then we have to manually add you to the other list. One of these days, we'll update that landing page. As always, links down below. Uh, if you like what we're doing here and would like to support our continued efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. And if just supporting us isn't enough, we also toss you a bone with some bonus content, including usually about two hours of bonus audio. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For the lobbyists, thanks for joining us. And be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. And stop by Sundays on YouTube for brunch. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.